This meeting is being recorded. Good evening. It is Thursday, July 7th. I am uh, Greg Hooksma, Chair of the Gig Harbor Planning Commission, and I'm calling this evening's meeting to order. First thing I'll do is roll call. Commissioner Brown. He appears to be muted. Yes. Commissioner Brown is present. Commissioner Krawczyk. Here. Commissioner Bradbury. Here. Commissioner Soltis. Here. Commissioner Greiner. Commissioner Greiner, can you hear me? Looks like she's frozen. Yes. Commissioner Just... Greiner, can you hear me now? Yes, I'm present. Okay, great, thanks. And uh, Commissioner Bennett is not going to be in attendance this evening. Um, with the city, we have um, Carl DeSemus, Michelle Thomas, Jeremy Hammer, and a special guest appearance this evening is the city attorney, Daniel Kinney. <clears throat> welcome, welcome, Daniel. We really appreciate you taking the time to be here. <clears throat> so first order of business is um, approval of the minutes from our June 2nd meeting. Are there any corrections or notations, comments about the, meet, the minutes of June 2nd? I will move for approval. I second. Okay, we have a motion on the floor with a second. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor of the motion say aye. 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 Motion passes unanimously. Okay, uh, with the new requirements, um, we do allow public comments at every meeting. So uh, at this time, I will op be opening the floor for public comment. Each commenter will be allowed three minutes uh, of time. That time will be kept by Michelle Thomas. At the 30 second mark, she will give you a signal and you'll uh, be requested to um, wrap up your remarks. At the three minute time limit, then your microphone will be turned off. Public comment may be made um, remotely or by phone, just need to raise your hand. Um, you can raise your hand on your phone by pressing star nine. And then once I call your name or your phone number, please state your name, your address, and you can begin your comments and your time will start at the, uh, at, at the end of introducing yourself and your address. All remarks need to be addressed to the commission as a body and not to any specific commissioner. We request that all speakers be courteous in their language and deportment and, shall, and not engage in or discuss or comment on personalities or indulge in derogatory remarks or insinuations with regard to any commissioner, the chair, or any member of the staff or the public. These guidelines are intended to promote an orderly system of holding a public meeting to give every person an opportunity to be heard and to ensure that no individuals are embarrassed by voicing their opinions. Okay, given that, I will open the floor to public comment. And as soon as I get the list, Bonnie O'Malley. Bonnie, you have your microphone muted. Okay, no, it should be okay now. Yeah, we can hear you. This is Bonnie O'Malley. I live at 8101 Bay Ridge Avenue. I'm a co-founder of what I'd like to shorten to the Alliance. Um, and I want to speak kind of in generalities because I know some of my co-speakers are going to address your agenda items. Um, I'd like to thank you first and foremost because I get the impression that you are hearing us. And um, from the notes on the agenda for this evening, um, I see a lot of topics that maybe uh, you now recognize need more discussion. And um, we are hoping, uh, because I see you also put my letter into the agenda, that uh, we can continue to have some dialogue on, on these subjects. Uh, one of the things that concerned me the most was something that I asked to be uh, put forward to us. And that is the document that you included from a commercial operation who wants to 
sell you um, their services. And uh, I've been in retail and marketing all my life. This is an excellently uh, written document if you're trying to sell your business. What it is not is a document that gives the city of Gig Harbor any accurate information that, that actually is documented. Um, and so we have also provided at your request, meaning the, the commission in general, um, a document that we put together, uh, well, it actually comes directly from Airbnb DNA. And you will see when you compare those two documents that they are drastically different. Um, ours does show the, um, the actual locations of residents and that kind of information. So one thing I'm gonna ask you to do, and I, I'm sure you've already done this, is really compare those two documents. I know you didn't have a lot of time uh, having just received it yesterday. Uh, there's a lot of fear mongering. There's a lot of hyperbole. There's a lot of what ifs. There's even a, um, uh, a section there that shows, you know, this, they name it, you know, kind of um, a, a, a burning hotbed of STRs. And, and there's they're, one minute. They're doing this, you know, to, to get everybody uh, riled up so that you feel like you really need their services. So I really, really want you to take all of that into consideration. This is a sales pitch. This is not anything that anybody's giving you that they have yet researched. That, you know, to my knowledge, they haven't researched it. They're generalities. So we provided you with the Air um, DNA, Airbnb DNA one, and I think that's a very accurate um, comparison. So I want you to take that into consideration. Um, the second point is the Walla Walla study and, and the regulations that they have implemented. 15 seconds. They are not comparable to Gig Harbor. So I really would ask you to take a look at that as well. Um, and I think it's an injustice to the city. And that's time. Okay. Thank you, Ms. O'Malley. We appreciate your comments. Okay, I see someone, Denise, but no last name. Go ahead. Hello, can you? you yeah, yes, we can hear you with a very significant echo. Sorry about that. You have to, is that any better? You have to turn off your. Okay. Okay, how about now? Uh, we're still getting uh, a bad echo. Okay. Right. You have more than one device turned on in the same room. How about now? Is uh, it okay? Yeah, that's like okay now. Okay. Are we good? Yeah. Go ahead. Okay. My name is Glenn Peterson. My wife Denise and I own the residence at 8921 Franklin in Gig Harbor. I shared a letter dated July 1st responding to the Planning Commission's regs. Uh, we outlined why some of the regs were not reasonable. We also offered optional language that would be reasonable and help meet the needs of the city, local businesses, and our community. Uh, to date, the proposed STR regs continue to be built on a foundation of assumptions and fear. There is no identified STR impact on housing availability, attainability, or affordability. There are no crime stats driven by STRs that impact the safety of owners, guests, and neighbors. Also, unfortunately, there's no mention that STRs contribute to our welcoming community, support local businesses and the city through taxes and fees while keeping neighborhoods vibrant. We encourage you to inspect some of these STRs. They are excellent. To date, the STR process has been non-inclusive and the commission appears to uh, rely on two docs. The first is the STR report from an East Coast firm. The second is an STR reg from Walla Walla. The STR report is a sales deck from a vendor offering services to track STRs. I noted no new data other than the number of STRs, which conflicts with other data sources. Also noted a Fredericksburg council meeting complaint on this vendor. Some of the comments include, they are not set up to accommodate their customers on their website. We hope you can see and agree this practice is not efficient or effective. What procedures can the city do to select a proper company to perform a more efficient process? Now, notwithstanding these comments, what is not in dispute is that if the proposed definition of STRs are used, the commission will eliminate about 90% of STRs in Gig Harbor. 
The second dot from the commission are Walla Walla Regs, a farming community with three colleges. Other than being in the same state, there are a few similarities between Gig Harbor and Walla Walla in facts or data. Walla Walla had the unique issues, one being the lowest long-term rental rate in the state at the time of this reg. This comparison for STR purposes, purposes is not reasonable. So we ask that you consider the following changes. Change the definition of short-term rental, remove 90 nights per calendar year, remove primary residence and only one primary residence. We'd also like to note that community okay. feedback has been overwhelmingly in support of STRs but the effort to effectively eliminate SDRs continues from a few. Most SDRs in Gig Harbor are owned by residents of Gig Harbor and surrounding areas. We all maintain a local community connection. We all support reasonable and narrowly tailored regs that allow SDR owners to exercise property rights while supporting local businesses and our wonderful city. Again, the current proposed definition of STR will eliminate approximately 90% of STRs. This is unreasonable. I and many are available to work with the mayor, council or planning commission in any manner if requested. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Anyone else like to make a comment? <clears throat> Okay, I see no other hands, so I will close the public comment period of the meeting. As always, we appreciate the input from uh, the public and uh, uh, those in attendance and uh, that have been with us throughout a, uh, a major part of this process. So <laughs> we're gonna move into the next agenda item and that is uh, a study session, a continue, another study session about um, short-term rentals here in Gig Harbor. But I believe, um, at this point, uh, Daniel, Kenny, the city attorney, you wanted to take us into executive session. Do I understand that correctly? That's correct, yes. And um, I have some language to read into the record. I don't know if that made it to you or not. It was came fairly late. I can do that, or if you have it, feel free. I, I do not, go ahead, please. Great, okay. Uh, so we'll enter executive session pursuant to RCW 42.30.110 subsection one I due to potential litigation will be an executive session for, I'm gonna recommend um, 10 minutes. Um, we can always extend that, um, but we cannot come back early, just FYI. Um, there will be no action to follow, though the meeting will continue upon our return from executive session. Um, and so the planning commission will leave this meeting and go to a different link. And Carl, I don't know if you provided that. Um, and so we'll go to that link. So if the planning commissioners could please log out of this meeting and log into the other one, we will join um, the rest of staff and the uh, public back on this regular meeting in 10 minutes from when we leave. Okay. So the link, uh, the link that Daniel was referring to is that link that we just sent out everybody. So if you could just log out here, log into that one, and then we'll uh, log back into this meeting in 10 minutes, as Daniel said. So I'll see you over there. Commissioner Griner, I think you logged back into the same meeting. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, I know. No, I've been, I keep getting kicked out. Is that happening to everybody and it keeps freezing up or is that just me? I think it's you. I noticed that you froze up at the beginning of this meeting here, so. Okay, hopefully um, the other one will be okay. So. Okay, I'll see you over there. Okay, thank you.
So I'm taking off. Okay. Staff will be in an executive session for an initial five minutes.
There'll be an additional five more minutes.
There'll be an additional five more minutes.
Looks hey, like Greg, we have everybody, everybody okay. back except Bob. I mean, uh, except Tom. <clears throat> if I have problems again, I'll I'll call in. Okay. Okay, but you're you're coming through crystal clear now. Yeah, I, I don't know what that was. So, okay, thanks. Do we have a commissioner in the attendees? Let's look and see here. No, nope. no, nope. okay. <clears throat> I know. I think he's. Um, I think Commissioner Brown is on a on his on his boat, so he's kind of juggling a little bit over there. I think. Oh, we don't have uh, John Krasik either. Oh, there's John. And you you can you can start um, if you choose. So. Yeah, we will um, give Commissioner Brown just a minute. He usually needs his life's assistance. <coughs> Getting hooked back up. Michelle, are you going to give him a call? Um. We only have his home line. Oh, okay. All right. Well, then I, I think we will get started um, just so we can get the, the meeting moving along. We do have a quorum. So um, and, and speaking of which, I, I have to leave the meeting early. So when I uh come up against my hard deadline then um john i will turn the meeting over to you as the vice chair to continue running the meeting through its completion this evening okay greg okay so um carl then i shall turn the floor over to you and we'll start doing some more hard work okay sounds good thank you chair um so uh, thank you, commissioners, and good evening. Good evening to the public as well. Uh, thank you for joining us. Um, we are here again tonight to uh, discuss uh, uh, short-term rentals, another study session. Um, we've got a few items uh, that were brought up um, at the June 2nd uh, public hearing, if you'll recall. Uh, we had a few items and questions that were brought up by uh, planning commissioners at that meeting. Um, we heard some really great testimony, I think, from the public, um, and uh, there were a couple of follow-up questions that were forwarded uh, to staff as well that we did a little bit of work on. Um, before I get into that, though, I wanted to just note a couple of things for the record. One, that we received a lot of written public comment um, leading up to this meeting. I shouldn't say a lot, maybe four or five uh, written letters. And I think one of them were, one of, one of those were referenced in some of the public testimony we heard this evening. Uh, and for, for the public's benefit and also the planning commission's benefit, um, at these regular study session meetings, we will not, we do not accept written public comment. We will only accept written public comment at public hearings that have been advertised um, appropriately and noticed appropriately. Um, so, but those written comments are not, um, are not for nothing. We will uh, take those comments, they will go into the record and they will be provided to the Planning Commission uh, as part of the next public hearing notice. And if we were in between Planning Commission and Council, then they would go into the record for Council's consideration at their first public hearing. So that's how we do that. Um, I also wanted to note that some of the public comment that we received, at least some of the written public comment we received, was relative to um, a document that some members of the Gig Harbor Short-Term Rental Alliance, I believe, 
uh, were able to get through um, a loophole in our online um, filing system at the city. Uh, that, that those regulations were not meant for public consumption. They were not reviewed by planning commission. They've not been presented here this evening. And in fact, those regulations were not really reviewed by staff either. It was really just, um, it was almost, we took an old set of regulations and we were just throwing, keeping some notes on that set. They got, they got moved from one folder to another. And when they were moved into that other folder, apparently that folder had an open link associated with it. Um, and so I want to apologize uh, to the public for any confusion that that may have caused. Um, and I wanted to make sure that the, the public is aware that we will be um, taking your comments um, into the record regardless, and uh, they will be reviewed. So, uh, and thank you for providing those. Uh, lastly, I wanted to note that the Walla Walla ordinance that we provided to you all this evening um, I think the, I think it was a it was a bit misconstrued, and maybe I should have I should have explained it a little better in my um, in my memo. But I, we were not trying to make any kind of comparison between Gig Harbor and 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 the city of Walla Walla. We recognize that they are very different places, um, very different um, demographics, very different um, um, economics. Um, they have a, a different um, tourist draw. Um, and they're in entirely different um, places in the state. What we were trying to demonstrate with that ordinance that we provided, however, is that what, what they used as a basis for, for adopting their ordinance is really good. Uh, I've, I've not seen an ordinance probably that's as detailed as theirs is and that provides as, many, as much support um, from their comprehensive plan um, and from research that they did leading up to uh, adopting those regulations. And that's been something that um, the Planning Commission has, uh, has asked for throughout these deliberations um, and noted several times, I believe, that if, you know, as we move forward and we get to a, the point of a recommendation, we want to be sure that we communicate to council why. Here's, here's why we chose these, here's why we chose these regulations. Here is the work that we did. Here is support for those regulations. And, and within that recommendation, making sure that, um, that the Planning Commission, uh, that the council knows that Planning Commission is recommending these regulations with these, these, these areas of support. So um, that was the reason for, the, uh, for, for including the Walla Walla Ordinance. I would also note the Walla Walla Ordinance is significant in that it was the second ordinance that they passed. We actually just today were able to get a hold of the first ordinance that they passed. There was a glitch in their website. We just weren't able to get it. Jeremy even put in a couple of calls to Walla Walla and, and spoke with a couple of their planners. Um, and they were working on their end to try and get us this first ordinance. And we finally just got it. But the, the interesting thing about their process and that we wanted to highlight is that they went through a very similar process that we've been going through. Uh, they passed an ordinance uh, in, I think, April or something like that. And then in October or November of the same year, they passed another ordinance, which is the ordinance that we provided to you. So they, they passed one ordinance, realized that there were some significant issues and flaws with it, um, and or that they were really inundated uh, with short-term rental um, applications during that short period of time. And they immediately passed another ordinance um, in order to kind of uh, stop stop gap or you know fill that hole, so it just an, a, an interesting process, and so we wanted to share it with you all. And I think that ordinance that we presented to you, if you read through it, it talks about what their process was and what kind of what they went through. Um, so, you know, this is this this issue is um, sticky. It's a it's a very hard issue. It's probably one of the harder issues that we'll tackle as a group. Um, there, there are others, of course, that will be difficult as well, but this is, this is a very difficult one. Um, and we should, and you should be proud of the work that um, you've put into it thus far, for sure. Um, another thing I want to address is that one of the, one of the ideas that came out of the, the public hearing was that we reach out and have a discussion with the Gig Harbor Short-Term Rental Alliance. The Gig Harbor Short-Term Rental Alliance heard that, they sent a letter, we provided that letter to you 
Um, again, we don't take written comment, but that letter we thought was um, was germane um, in in that it was responding directly to um, a request that the planning commission made within their deliberations, and so we felt like that was um, fair to include. Jeremy and I did reach out and had a great discussion with two members of the Gig Harbor Short Term Rental Alliance. Um, I wanted to just hit a couple of highlights for you all uh, from that discussion. Um, they have about 350 members now in that in their organization. Now those aren't all Gig Harbor residents. They're um, they are folks from all over the country. So they've got they have people who are here within Gig Harbor. They have business owners within Gig Harbor. Um, there are short-term rental owners. Uh, I think there are just some property owners who are in support. Um, and then there are other entities from, they told me from around the country uh, that are just interested in defending short-term rental rights uh, or just interested in these processes and or may want to open a short-term rental in Gig Harbor. Um, they noted that they've got about, they, they count about 33 short-term rentals within the city limits, not including liveaboards. So taking liveaboards out of the equation, they count about 33. They don't have tax data. Um, and that is something that we've struggled to get a hold of any kind of specific data re relative to taxes um, to see what we're actually bringing in through our lodging taxes for short-term rentals specifically. Um, what we were able to provide you with in that spreadsheet um, that was in your packets is about the best we have. And it's, it's good, but it's not great, obviously. Um, most of the short-term rentals uh, within Gig Harbor, if not all, they said, are using major platforms. And then they said that without one of those major platforms, that their business would be, would be dead, basically. That you, they, you almost have to use one of those platforms in order to generate any kind of real business for short-term rentals. Um, they, the Gig Harbor Short-Term Rental Alliance has petitioned um, downtown businesses. So they've got a, a petition signed by a, a, apparently a large majority of businesses in the downtown area in support of short-term rentals in Gig Harbor. Um, they said they would share that with us. I, uh, to date, I haven't seen it, um, uh, but we have received a couple of things from residents. I haven't had a chance to review some of that stuff. We've been receiving things from folks um, up to, I think even today we received something. So um, I haven't had a chance to review everything yet um, in trying to get prepared for this meeting. So I will, um, and we, it, will be, it will be shared. Um, another interesting fact that they provided me um, was that most of the rentals they believe are probably not renting full-time. A lot of the rental owners, short-term rental owners in the city of Gig Harbor um, again, this is anecdotal from the conversation I had, um, but, but they state that most of them are not full-time short-term rental properties, not 365 days a year, in other words. Many of them, they say, are uh, folks who are keeping, um, trying to maintain, um, sort of live in place, trying to age in place, so trying to keep their home. Um, this is a this is extra income for them in order to maintain the home um, and and pay property taxes uh, that continue to increase. Those are the major highlights. They they have some issues with some of the regulations. Most of them, I think we've we have already heard from them in. Um, in what they've provided. So I don't think there's anything there that is new that I need to pass along. So I think I'll leave that there unless there's any, any questions from any commissioners on that, um, on that report or any of the other things that I talked about before that. And then I can, I can continue on after that, maybe chair. Anybody have questions? Seeing none, okay. Um, okay, so what we put together for you this evening then, as I started out with, is um, we kind of went back to this table format, um, rather than putting together a full set of regulations, uh, we wanted to focus in on just a few of those more 
overarching questions and see if we can iron out those issues. Uh, and once we, and if we do, then we can go back to the draft regulations and plug in um, the results of this discussion um, in order to have that full set of regulations. And we had discussed having um, uh, the next public hearing. As you all know, we're going to do one more public hearing with Planning Commission here before uh, before you put together your recommendation or put forward your recommendation. We were going to do that on the 21st, but um, after the research and discussions that Jeremy and I have had um, and just kind of looking through this stuff, we felt it would be prudent to give ourselves a little more time and push it off and push the hearing off into August, which then would give us another study session on short-term rentals if we need it on the 21st, uh, and then move into a, uh, the actual hearing with full regulations in August. So at the end of this discussion, I guess we could have, we could have that discussion about whether or not we feel confident uh, in Jeremy and I going back to the, to the draft regulations, refining those based on the results of today's discussion, bringing them back on the 21st for another look, or getting them ready, getting all the documentation in place for the public hearing in August, and just waiting until then. We, we would likely still hold a meeting on the 21st, um, and we'd probably bring you something else <laughs> if that were the case. So. Um, but we can discuss all that at the end. Um, so to, to begin, before we jump into uh, the table, there's one thing that I want to discuss um, that I'd like to throw out on the table first. And that is sort of the operation of how the permitting of short-term rentals would work. Um, if you'll recall early on in this in these discussions, we talked about a about using a business license uh, in conjunction with the with a land use permit. We we went away from that idea of using a business license because of because of the fact that our business license renewals are not reviewed on an individual basis. Um, they just sort of auto renew when a, so if somebody gets a business license in the city of Gig Harbor for a new business, we issue them that business license if they've met the criteria. And then annually, their business license, they need to go to the state and renew their business license with the state, which they do. The city does not review that renewed business license. It's just an automatic renewal as long as there's no change in the, it's not a new business um, and or the, the business hasn't changed hands in some manner. So if somebody owns a, um, a hair salon in a building and they sell that hair salon, that new entity would have to get a new business license and we would review that business license again at that time. So that's how that currently works in the city of Gig Harbor. So when we learned, I, I didn't understand that previously. When I learned that, I realized we can't go that way then because we need something that we can renew for short-term rentals. And we've all decided that. What, I've, what we've since learned um, is in working with Josh Stecker, the city clerk, he's done some really deep dives on this and talked with the Department of Revenue. And what we found that we can do is that we, we can, um, we can uh, define a business license in such a way in other words, flag it in such a way that when it when someone does renew it at the state, that it would be flagged then and sent to the city for an annual review. So it can be done, um, and it's and it's and it's a fairly common. It's not really a workaround. It's a it's a fairly common thing. It's just not something that the city of Gig Harbor has done before. So. In, in learning that, what, we've, what we think the right avenue here is, is to require the type two land use permit, the short-term rental type two land use permit that we've been discussing here all along, um, which would be, which would then give the uh, operator, the homeowner, property owner, um, their entitlement to use that property as a short-term rental. Then they would have to go to the state, get their business license. 
that would then come to the city for a um, for an approval. If the city approves that business license, then they've got a business license for one year. That business license then would need to be renewed in one year. When it gets renewed, it would be flagged in that in the business licensing system at the state would come to the city for review. And then we would be able to review it against the against the approval criteria um, in the code and or any conditions that were placed on that permit, that type two permit when it was approved. One thing that one way that we've been thinking of doing that review is to use an affidavit um, that would essentially be a list of criteria check boxes on a form that would be sent to uh, the operator of the short term rental who would check those boxes, whatever those whatever those criteria are. Um, for instance, have you have you been paying your taxes? Do you still have your state required insurance? Have there been any complaints? So on and so forth. How many nights have you rented your unit for? Those sorts of questions. They would sign it. It would get notarized. Excuse me. And that would go, that would, and that would be reviewed then by the city. We would put that in the file and their license could then be renewed. This would also be the time that we would review that business for code compliance. If there have been code compliance issues throughout the year, if we've had complaints that we were able to substantiate, so they'd have to be substantiated complaints, um, then we would have those on record. We could either ask the short-term rental owner about those at that time, or maybe we've already had discussions with them, um, but we could review their license against those complaints as well. And if we find that they're, they've been out of compliance because due to those complaints, they haven't been communicating with the city, they haven't been rectifying those, those issues, then we could withhold their business license at that time. So the reason that using a business license is good is that it gives the city a little more flexibility. It's much easier to withhold or deny a business license or even to revoke a business license than it is a land use permit. Much, much more difficult to do and much more arduous because you have to go through the notice of violation process um, through, through code enforcement. So it actually answers a lot of questions and, and a few, a lot of those questions were in the table and questions that you all had and things that we heard from the public, insurance, taxes, enforcement, um, administration of this code, a whole bunch of things kind of get taken care of if we were to if we were to utilize a process like that. And so maybe I'll stop there, Chair, and maybe we can have a quick discussion about this before we jump into the table because this is something that's kind of outside what's in the table. Although it'll it'll feed into it. Okay. Well, uh, thank you very much for the the research and the thought that you and Jeremy put into that. Um, what do you all think about that, Commissioner Soltis? <clears throat> I think it sounds uh, good, Carl. I just was wondering, is there a, a, a fee that's associated with an annual renewal? Um, would there be like a $150 a year kind of thing? How does that work, initial and renewal? Yeah, there is there is a renewal fee um, at the, well, at the state level. Michelle, do we have one? We don't have a renewal fee at the local level currently because we don't review those physically, you know, we're not touching each one of those when they renew, but our fee schedule, I'm pretty sure Josh and I talked about this. I'm pretty sure that our fee schedule does include a renewal fee. So I think it's already, I think that's already baked in. If it's not, it's something that we could bake in and we absolutely would, because we need to, we need to recoup that time. And that's pretty easy to do. I think it's $40 because yeah, it's a $40 annual just, fee. I just did that today. Oh, did you? Yes. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> now, now forty dollars for, and that was for renewing your local business license for your city That's of New Harbor business license. That's in addition to the my regular business license. And forty dollars for Gig Harbor. Okay. And we and just to, just to clarify, in the interest of the. Um, that, that had nothing to do with an STR, correct? No. 
Oh, no, okay. it's a culture. Uh, thank you. <laughs> um, and, and so, and that's something that we could, you know, that we would figure out um, at the administrative level, whether or not, you know, that's enough money to recoup staff time in actually doing this review. Because again, you're paying that $40, that's really, that's really um, for an automatic renewal, right? I mean, so there's very little administration that's going into that. With the short-term rental renewal, there's gonna be quite a bit more. I mean, we're gonna be producing that affidavit. There's gonna be some, some correspondence back and forth. There might be some review. There could be site visits. Uh, you know, there could be a number of um, items within that process that, so we, we would have to look at what, the, what that fee actually entails. Other thoughts? One of our original goals was to make this process less cumbersome, less bureaucratic for people who were uh, seeking these licenses or permits. Could, can, could we state that that would be the case if we, if we adopted your suggestion, Carl? I, th I think we could, Commissioner Brown. Um, um, and, and, and here's why, because right now, the way it's set up with the conditional use permit it's it's pretty cumbersome. Um, you know that's a that's a that's a long process that someone has to go through just for a short term rental, and and again it was never set up for a short term rental. It was set up for lodging level one, level two, level three. So really a different use. Um, so in in this scenario that I just brought up, you know we're talking about a um, a, a type two permit. Uh, which is an administrative approval, still, they're still noticing. So those folks in the neighborhood get noticed. They get an opportunity to um, uh, comment on the application, which I think that's important. Um, but once we're done with that land use entitlement, as long as that person is the primary owner, primary resident, well, we'll talk more about that. As long as they're the owner of that property um, and they're the owner of that short-term rental, they have that land use entitlement that runs that runs with them. Um, and so they never have to go back to the land use side of things as long as they stay in compliance, obviously. Uh, the only time then, you know, the, the only time they would have to do anything, it's then it's really on the operator to maintain good records throughout the year, make sure that they're following all of the rules, not, you know, and avoiding avoiding substantial complaints um, that, you know, that that actually are uh, outside of uh, outside of the code in other words not just not just people complaining that that there's a short-term rental um, and as long as they are able to answer that affidavit um, with with um, specificity uh, and uh, honestly then there sh that should be a really easy should be a really easy process for someone I think and significantly less expensive, right? Significantly and, and, less and, expensive, and much shorter, uh, much shorter on the calendar. All of all of which is good for the the uh, people that would like to do this. Absolutely, yeah. So I think it accomplishes the the goals, Commissioner Brown, good. as far as that goes. Well, the thing I like about it is that the um, it basically puts the onus, you know, back on the, the homeowner to, instead of on the city, you know, if, if you have an affidavit, affidavit that, you know, yes, I'm paying my taxes, you know, they're providing the information instead of us trying to, to track it, or you, instead of the staff, you know, having that additional burden. Um, I, I, I think uh, I like the sound of it. Yeah, I think that nails it on the head, and and I'm going to give Jeremy uh, Hammer some some credit here. He 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 mentioned this fairly early on <laughs> in the process because he found it uh, at least at a couple other jurisdictions that were doing something similar to this, not exactly, but something similar. Um, and uh, we just didn't we didn't we didn't go that road. We kind of went a different way, but we've kind of come back to it, and it I think it makes really good sense. Uh, okay, well, with that, then, if that's if we've got that settled as far as process goes, then I think I'll move into the table. If that's okay, Chair. Sure. All right, let me find that here for you. Everybody, see that? Okay, and I'm going to enlarge this table too here for you. 
and make it so I can only see one page at a time. There. Okay. Everybody see that okay? No, I cannot, but go ahead. Is, does it help if I blow it up a little bit more, Commissioner Brown? Or? No, the difficulty is that I don't, I'm, I'm not in my home and I don't oh. have a magnifying uh, screen. Got it. So, uh, okay, I apologize. Well, the, the table that we sent uh, in the packet is the table that we're looking at. However, uh, I've added a few things to it since it was sent out to you um, just to help with the discussion. Um, and just because, you know, Jeremy and I like to keep everybody on their toes all the time. That's, that's how we, how we tend to operate. Um, and one of the things that we added to this on in item number one is this idea of, you know, owner occupied versus primary residence, something that we've found and that we've heard a lot from the, from the public is that the definition of owner occupied and non owner occupied is confusing and kind of misleading. And, and we've noted that a lot of other jurisdictions have found other ways to define kind of the same thing, but it just sounds better when, and doesn't, it's not, it's not so misleading. So um, we, we are, we're, I guess we're advocating in some ways for the use of primary residence versus, um, versus an owner occupied. Uh, and we've added a couple of reasons why we feel like it's clear, it's more concise. Um, it still limits the number of nights that a unit can be rented. Um, it limits the number of short-term rentals uh, an operator can operate within the city. Uh, because if, you, if, if this is your primary residence, you only can have one primary residence by definition, right? And I think that was one of the things that that we've been interested in in these discussions is sort of figuring out a way to make sure that these aren't being proliferated across the city by, uh, you know, maybe one entity owning multiple listings uh, and renting them all out. This, this solves that issue and makes it far less ambiguous when we're talking about owner occupied versus non owner occupied. The definition that we've provided here states, and I'm going to read it um, for Commissioner uh, Brown's benefit, it means a person's usual place of return for housing as documented by motor vehicle registration, driver's license, voter registration, or other such evidence as determined by the director. A person may only have one primary residence. So we would have, when, when someone comes in with their affidavit to renew their business license, these, this is one of the check boxes. This is one of the things that we would be looking for is, okay, is it still your primary residence? Provide us with that proof that this is your primary residence. Something that we'd have to work out in this, I suppose, and something that maybe we should discuss now is, does this does this get us to a point or what is the planning commission's feeling at this time about this idea of only allowing someone to rent out their entire house for, I think right now we say 90 nights out of the year and the rest of the time, the rest of the year, they would only be allowed to rent. I think it was two bedrooms in our most recent regulations. Is that still the direction that the commission is interested in, or is there? Uh, I, Sorry. I, I would comment that uh, based on public input, that this particular requirement has become quite problematic. Uh, and uh, e even uh, during earlier discussions, we had comments on how severe restrictions uh, on, on existing uh, STRs uh, would be placed if we stuck by any kind of an owner-occupied or primary residence definition. Uh, th this, this is an element that I think at this point needs a lot more discussion. I'm still interested in uh, going with the idea of the, the uh, two bedroom rentals uh, and um, 
that it would have to be owner occupied 270 days out of the year, with the possibility of non owner occupied rentals for the other 90 days. Um, subject to, uh, I have some different feelings when we get to number eight as to how we deal with people that are already operating short term rentals and how we can try to accommodate those situations uh, where those people have been abiding by. Uh, the rules or, or at least making a good faith effort to remit their hotel motel taxes. So uh, that's still my direction subject to some exceptions in number eight. And, and, and let me just preface that a little bit with the, the reason that I ask the question and the reason that I'm relating it to this primary residence idea is that there, there needs to be some correlation, I think, between primary, if we were to go with this primary residence definition, there would need to be some correlation between that and the short-term rental definition as well. Primary residence in the legal sense, at, you know, in fe federal law, I think means six months plus one day. I don't think, you know, if, if, if the if the planning commission is still wanting to go with this idea of splitting up the whole house versus just a few rooms being rented, then we would need to refine this primary residence definition so that it captures that idea. If we didn't do that, if we went with just kind of a flat, this just needs to be your primary residence, and we and we did away with the idea of just renting out two bedrooms for most of the year, then we wouldn't probably have to do anything with that primary residence definition. It could just stand alone. That, so that's that's the reason, that's really the reason that I ask. And I and it's and I think it is still um, a big question just based on um, you know Commissioner Bradbury's feedback, Commissioner Krosick's thoughts, you know, those are they're not in alignment. And 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 one last thought there, I'm sorry. Renting out just two bedrooms for the majority of the year administratively is has has some problems i think you know we've we've thought a lot about it and it's diff it's going to be difficult to enforce i guess i you know just to get down to it there 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 you know the, there could be complaints about well this person's renting three rooms versus two rooms you know they could come in and say nope we've only been renting out two rooms it's going to be difficult um, for us to prove, for the city to prove one way or the other. And so I, you know, I, I just, I don't, I, I don't want us to put together regulations just for the, and we've said this before during these discussions, we don't want to put together regulations just for the sake of having regulations. I just don't know how enforceable that is. Um, while I understand the direction that you want to go with it, I'm just not sure that it is um, it is enforceable. Commissioner Soltas, what are your thoughts? Well, I think I'm I'm with uh, Commissioner Bradbury that we need to kind of really <clears throat> take a deep breath and think about this uh, uh, owner occupied our uh, primary residence as the only way going forward. Um, I think we, uh, I, I agree with Carl in terms of how you're gonna really track the number of rooms rented like that. And, and honestly, people, the way that this whole market works, it's almost always a whole house rental. I mean, if, if I understand what I've been hearing and reading about, I mean, renting rooms like that is kind of a little bit, uh, old school to maybe find a maybe that's not the right word but people generally want to want rent the whole house i mean that's kind of when they want to get away they don't want to have somebody next to them down the hallway probably sharing a bathroom or whatever so i'm really um i'm not sure that we can make there's a way to make this work without a lot of staff time and a lot of the uh, angst and uh I just think we need to really take a step back and think about maybe this is not going to um, be a workable option. 
That's where I'm heading right now, at least I need to have more dialogue with everybody. Well, well Carl, I, uh, in that vein, you had, from your notes of your meeting with uh, the two women from the Alliance, um, I, I'm either misunderstanding something or we're getting conflicting information because I, I thought one of the points that, that they said was that, that most of the people it is their primary residents that are that are doing this. And yet we had one of the public comments today um, indicating that that you'll shut down 90% of the the STRs in Gig Harbor if you have that requirement. So they can't both be true. Well, I think I think what they're saying is. So <clears throat> with the idea that most of these are primary residences and what they relayed to me is that a lot of these folks will, they, they're, it's their primary residence because they're living in it for six months out of the year plus one day. So legally it's their primary residence. Oftentimes some people are either living with someone else when they're able to get a short-term rental, when they're able to rent their home out to someone, they'll go and live with somebody else. They've got sort of an established um, another place to live, or they've got a condo in Mexico or someplace like that. That's their, you know, they've got a vacation home someplace that they go and live in and then short-term rental out the house for the rest of the time. The money that they make on that short-term rental for those six months or however many months it is that they're able to actually rent it, that's paying for the home, paying for the taxes, it's able to keep them in the house. This isn't. They, this is not a hundred percent of the thirty-three short-term rentals by any means. But they said there's a. They, that what they relayed to me is that there's a, a quite a few, uh, within their group that are in that that are in that boat. Mm. And I think the point then is that if we were to say you can only rent out two bedrooms for that many days out of the year, that sort of, that digs in on those people's income, who are doing it that way. Now that's neither here nor there. I mean we're not certainly not here to um, make regulations for just a few. I mean, we're obviously looking at the global, right. you know, the global perspective here, but um, I'm just, I think, I think that was the, I think that was what that, where that comment was coming from. Okay. Thanks. Commissioner Brown, what do you think? Well, I know it will be enormously controversial, I guess my thinking is <clears throat> to have some sort of a grace period for people who do own non-owner occupied short-term rentals and allow them to continue to operate those if they come into compliance for some period of time. Maybe it's a couple, three years even, but not to permit any additional ones to be added. And I guess that's the compromise I would lean toward. The idea being to moderate the penalty on these folks, but yeah, I guess that's where I'm at. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Greiner. So I, I really like the primary residence definition that you guys have. I, th that feels a whole lot better. Um, so I'm, I really like that as opposed to the owner occupied that we were using before. Um, there are a couple of thoughts because I've been thinking about this a lot in between. And you know, I, people who've been already doing this and are operating legally, I, I kind of like the idea of, of finding a way to potentially allow that with whatever paperwork or whatever we need to have with that. Um, but I guess I'm a little confused why if you're already operating a short-term rental legally, you wanna open it up so that way more people can come in because that's competition for you. Um, the other part that I think is really important is in, what if we allow people who are already operating legally to have a grace period or whatever, 
And then we limit the number of new, of new short-term rentals. I mean, that's a way to kind of accomplish what we're trying to do, not let things get out of hand, but still allow for thoughtful consideration of people who are willing to do it the appropriate way and still have some control over it. I hope that made sense. I wrote all sorts of notes down here. Uh, Did so any of that make sense? I, I, let me just ask a, a, um, a clarifying question. So you're saying that the folks who are operating legally, so that would be those folks who have a conditional use permit already? Mm -hmm. You're not talking about those folks who have been operating with just a business license up until these regulations are passed. Right, because my understanding is that that's not what the city requires. Is that correct? If you only have a business license, do you meet the city requirement for a short-term rental? No. Right, so, okay. yeah. So those so, folks, okay, go ahead. Sure, sorry. So, um, so I think that's the crux of the matter. <clears throat> and. And how do we how do we solve that challenge? <clears throat> because um, the you know I, I think the question has been asked by the alliance or we'll say the public writ large. You know what is the problem you're fixing? <clears throat> and as I indicated at the last meeting, is that we're not fixing a problem; we're trying to prevent a problem. Um, and so the i think there there are sound reasonable logical legitimate arguments that say this has been happening in our city and we don't have data that says there's been a negative impact um and so how do we protect the interests of those people that have already been operating um, and admittedly, there's what the hand four or five only that have gone through the CUP process. Um, so how do we, I think it's, I think it's easy to protect them, but how do we, and when I say protect, they protect their financial interests of, of, you know, kind of the financial plan that they've already made or the inv financial investment they've already made. Um, So, so I, I, I understood what you, what you said, Commissioner Grina, I think. Um, and I agree with kind of all the comments that have been made so far um, that um, how do we, how do we strike that middle ground um, and say, okay, you know, we hear you, there hasn't been a problem, but the, the harsh reality is that, that if you look across the, the spectrum of the world, the United States, Washington State, you know, you can shrink it down or make it as big as you want, that, that the inevitable march of the proliferation of Airbnb in a town like Gig Harbor is, is it happens. Um, as it's happened in Gig Harbor, you know, we've gone from, you know, again, whatever the start date number was, 2016, we had zero, and now we have 33, and uh, according to the Alliance's numbers, and, and as high as in the 60s, according to different other different, you know, databases, which just, I think, speaks to the fact of how hard it is to get good data, and I think, again, that's a logical, you know, that's a fair to, argument and discussion. Um, so, I, what I want to, our recommendation to be is, is to figure out how we can protect those interests of the people that are already doing this at whatever level. Um, and at the same time, prevent it from um, getting out of hand, you know, it's for lack of a better term. And, and 
know, because there are, you know, there, there are lots of things you can draw from the, from the comp plan and, and from the, the gig Harbor codes. And, you know, we have, we have historical design regulations. We have a whole design manual. We have, you know, everything that's ever been done in this city is, is to, you know, help protect um, what this city is all about, you know, a, a turn of the century fishing village that people want to come to. Um, so if it stops being Gig Harbor, then people want to, are, are going to stop wanting to come to come to Gig Harbor and then it collapses on itself. So anyway, those are my thoughts right now. Well, since we kind of jump forward to number eight, so I'll, I'll share what my thoughts are. What I was going to say when we got down there is I agree with what's been said regarding protecting the financial interests of those roughly 30 or so people uh, or 30 or so uh, groups that are, are owning and currently renting within the city. And so I'd like to find a way to uh, that we could protect them and allow them I know, Carl, you don't like to use the word grandfathering, but some sort of system that would allow them to uh, continue to operate their businesses. But uh, we cut it off there. I don't want to see, uh, I, I think the word I would use, a proliferation of non-owner occupied short-term rentals. Uh, also, in looking at the Walla Walla ordinance, which I think is highly relevant to our discussion here today, uh, I identified about 10 different uh, things in their ordinance statements that they made that would relate to Gig Harbor in terms of protection uh, and keeping the quality of neighborhoods. So when we're looking as for justification as to why we're doing that, I think there's a lot in here uh, that I agree with that I think we want to say this is what we want to continue to have in Gig Harbor. And so uh, I don't know, Carl, if you can sit down with the city attorney uh, and some of your staff and figure out a way that we can do this. But, uh, you know, that, that, that's, I guess, what I'd like to see is to come up with a idea or a blueprint or a framework as to how we can protect those individuals who are currently doing this uh, and uh, stop it there. Okay. Thank you for that. And, and um, I'm going to have to um, beg off from the meeting. So John, I'm going to turn uh, the meeting over to you at this point. Um, and, but with just a final comment, and I, I, I especially agree with your comment, uh, Commissioner Grina, about the using primary residence as opposed to owner occupied. I, I think that that's uh, an improvement um, and uh, it's a, a better place to work from. So with that, um, thank you all for your input. Thanks again to the public. And uh, John, the meeting is yours. Okay, thanks, Greg. Uh, okay, so where, uh, where do we want to go with this now? I don't know that we really have consensus on this issue. I think we have two commissioners that maybe want to open it up. And, and correct me if I'm wrong there, uh, is what you're looking at is to opening this up to more people having uh, non-primary re uh, residents uh, STRs, or uh, are you in concurrence with so, what some of the rest of us have said that we would uh, kind of cut this off either at the existing number or at some other number? I would just simply state that a requirement that it be uh, a primary residence uh, is too restrictive. Uh, I would prefer to explore some other way of having, let, let's say a gross or overall limitation in the growth of STRs in the community, uh, as opposed to trying to restrict it to just one use type. Uh, I had made a comment some time ago that when we are talking about uh, owner-occupied primary residence requirements, we are beginning to, to overlap and look more like bed and breakfast operations than STRs, which as Commissioner Krasik indicated are quite commonly whole house rentals. Yeah, 
and, and Bob, were you the other one that uh, maybe had some uh, some uh, differing views on that? You know, I'm trying to figure out where I where I fall on the spectrum, John. Um, I I think we have to figure out whether we want to allow anything at all after some per, at some point in time. If we correct for you know past issues uh, and we give people an opportunity to make things right and uh, properly register, and then we either draw a, a line in the sand, or it sounds like if we continue with this primary residence thing, then all we've done is we've, we've drawn a temporary line in the sand, and then anything in the future would be able allowed if it was a primary residence. So that would not stop um, uh, the number of STRs from growing in the community. So I think I, I think where Commissioner Radbury is going was uh, that same kind of direction. You know, maybe we don't even need that primary residence thing if we're going to establish a cutoff. Then that we establish a cutoff end of story period. It's a number. It's, it's whatever it is. It's thirty three or it's forty, whatever it is, and we stop there. Uh, John, I want to make, make one comment. Greg mentioned and you mentioned the um, Walla Walla had a lot of references in it in its ordinance. Well, I've been going through the our comprehensive plan a fair amount for another reason. And there's tons of every chapter has a reference and protect the historical character or something along that line of the community. And you know what that means exactly is kind of subject to interpretation, but it sounds to me like that's always been a concern of the, the overall comprehensive plan. So that, that may put us in some pretty solid ground for what we're thinking about doing here. But I guess the bottom line is I'm, I'm in favor of giving people an opportunity to uh, properly register for an STR license, however we want to make it, and then, um, then, then drawing a line, uh, drawing a, a specific number and stopping it for Gig Harbor. Okay. Hey, uh, Chair, can I, oh, sorry, Commissioner Brown, go ahead. Just to clarify your point there, Bob, for example, you'd say that we have 33 or 74 or something like that, STRs, and that would be a limit, but they would be allowed to continue to operate. Uh, is that what you're saying? Yeah, they would they would fall within the, the, the limit number and they would continue to operate. Um, and I wouldn't make it like two or three years. I mean, I, I think Tom if they are, have made a major investment in their property to accommodate this. That I don't think another year or two operations would let them really recoup that. So yeah, I'm saying set a set a limit and stop it. Okay, and then what about <clears throat> what happens to those properties when they change hands? Would they continue to be STRs but with a new owner? Well, I don't, uh, um, I don't know about that one, Tom. I mean, if we, I'm not they changed hands and yeah. they, then they, maybe they, no, I don't have a good answer for you on that one. Okay. The other, the other related issue I think that we haven't discussed yet, but need, need to be thinking about is what about multiple uh, ownerships? Uh, in Walla Walla, there's an outfit that owns, if I understand their, their website correctly, uh, a dozen or more STRs. And I, 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 don't think, I, I don't think we want that in Gig Harbor. We don't want to invite someone to come in and and own 35 of the 76 permitted STRs. Uh, a couple, just a couple points here. I, so I'm, I'm catching up now. I'm understanding. I think where 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 this is headed. I didn't realize we're headed in that direction. <clears throat> but what what we're saying, what you're essentially saying, is that we would have a cap on the number of short-term rentals just in general. So we're, we're, we're not concerned with owner occupied, non-owner occupied, that kind of goes out the window. Primary residence, the primary residence issue kind of fixes what you were just talking about, Commissioner Brown. We, we, that, wouldn't, that wouldn't be allowed if, if we were saying that it has to be your primary residence and we define what that primary residence is. But 
what you're kind of leaning towards here, I think, is kind of a lottery system, potentially. Um, you know, when we're issuing these permits, the idea behind issuing these permits is that they would they would run, they would be issued to an entity, so to the property owner. And if that ownership changes on that property, then they would need a new uh, permit and license in order to operate. So the the license the license definitely doesn't run with the land. Typically, a land use permit does run with the land. Um, but I think in, in the case of this short-term rental permit, it, we, would, we would be crafting it such that it is issued to the person. And we'd have to check into the legality of that, of course, as well. But placing a cap. So right now, what, we're, what, we're, what, what I think I'm hearing us, what I think I'm hearing you say is that we would allow all of those short-term rentals that are operating with CUPs as well as all of those short-term rentals that are operating with just a business license to continue to operate. They would have to come into compliance with whatever our new regulations are, but then that would be it. And so whatever that number is, which I think is, um, you know, for, as far as we know, I think, I think that number is far less than 33 um, that we know of right now, far less. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm going to say it's somewhere in one, two, three, four, five, somewhere in the, the seven range, maybe, maybe 10, but we'd have to, I'd have to go through this spreadsheet a little bit more carefully to make sure it's not going to capture all of those 33 that are operating or all of those, you know, 66 or whatever, whatever that number actually is out there. The other, the other the other problem with that is that I, we don't know what that number actually is, uh, and we don't have the data in front of us to be able to figure it out. Uh, Carl, so I, Carl, do we know how many business licenses have been issued? Yeah, that for short-term rentals, I mean, that's what I've got is I, the spreadsheet. The last time we did this was in June, um, and... We've got a spreadsheet with uh, a bunch of business, the, the, all these folks have gotten business licenses, but many of them are either not operating or we're not sure where their address is. Um, there's, you know, there's differing levels of uh, what, you know, what, what we've got on this list. It's not, you know, it's, it's, it's not clear. In other words, we've got some lodging level one in here, some of these were permitted as home occupations. Um, and so if we, you know, if we were, if we were going to go, so th this, this spreadsheet has 25 lines in it, for instance, I can't, I can't honestly say that all of these are operating currently. And some of them were issued business licenses. Those business licenses have since expired, so they're not operating today. Some of them are still operating. A few of them have conditional use permits. A few of them don't. Um, I don't think we would want to pick a number uh, based on any kind of data that we have currently, and I'm not sure that we could even get good enough data to come up with that, with that number if we're looking at what we currently have in the city. Well, suppose we did something like this. We said we're uh, prepared to approve uh, 30 STRs so long as the operators can demonstrate that, uh, th that they have had some, some kind of valid license or, or whatever. And uh, it, it, it seems to me we could pick some number, whether it's 30 or I don't know what, what it would be. It would be well more than the number we think exists, uh, and, uh, and and let those who want to continue operating STRs demonstrate that they've got some uh, legitimacy to them. That that would be their burden. Uh, I need to come online real quick, like here. I'll I'll make a comment, and then I need to let everybody know that I need to sign off at seven tonight. Uh, and that comment. 
is the restriction of no uh, STR should be within 150 feet of another one. My recollection is that whole discussion and then driving down to the 150 feet was a methodology of restricting the total number uh, that would be able to be permitted or get a business license operating within the city limits. And, and that would seem to be a reasonable way to do it without setting a discrete number. And, and I think, you know, that's, that's, a, that's a good point, Commissioner Bradbury. For both of these items, though, what we have to keep in mind is that we have to have some, we have to have some reason for those requirements, right? We need to have some, some policy support. And I know, Commissioner Soltis, you had brought up that there's some things in the, um, in the comp comprehensive plan, uh, like Wall City of Walla Walla did, uh, that would support uh, potentially some of those uh, ideas, uh, some of these regulations. Um, and, and that might be true. I've looked through the comp plan and I found some things that are definitely talk about neighborhood character, but a lot of it relates to design more than the actual fabric. I think I only found a couple of places where they talked about the flavor of the, of the neighborhood, you know, um, but most of it relates to design um, and how neighborhoods relate to neighborhoods and how business districts relate to business uh, to, to uh, residential neighborhoods, that sort of thing. Now we, we could go in and find, I'm sure we could find some things in there, but we would also have to have some data, I think, if we're putting some kind of restriction on the number of these uh, short-term rentals that we would allow, we'd have to have some, we'd have to have some rationale for what that number is, why we, why that number was chosen and what that number does um, to protect those things that, that, you know, that we're, that we're, that we're talking about as far as neighborhood character. Um, do we have, do we have data that shows that short-term rentals, for instance, have, are a nuisance? In the city of Gig Harbor currently, do we have data that shows that they will be a nuisance in the city of Gig Harbor, and that if we limit it to 33, 40 of these things, that that will eliminate that that nuisance issue? Carl, I think it goes back to what Greg says: is we're really trying to prevent a problem. Yeah. And uh, first of all, let me ask a question of the entire group and go through everybody: Do we have consensus? that we want to limit the number of short-term rentals in Gig Harbor to a relatively small number. So just kind of going through the group here, starting out with Bob Soltis. Yeah, I think we should, um, we should limit it to a, a, a number, yes. Okay, Commissioner Greina? Yes, we should limit it. Commissioner Brown? Yes. Okay, uh, who did I miss? I think that's all that's left. That's all that's left. <laughs> okay, we're we're getting down here in numbers, and and yes, that would be uh, uh, that would be my feeling as well, is that we we limit it to a relatively small number. Um, I'm just uh, uh, Carl, and and now we've got to develop the justification for whatever that number is going to be, and maybe this is something we might want to think about. Uh, I'd like to send you, Carl the list of the 10 things in the city of Walla Walla's ordinance that I think apply not just to Gig Harbor, but to cities in general as to why we want to have uh, certain limitations on the short-term rentals. And I think uh, if the rest of us could go maybe through uh, other ideas in terms of the city's code, uh, or, or other things that you can come up with. Plus, I think the research is out there. And maybe Carl, uh, if you could develop some of the research points that have appeared in articles or studies or reports that uh, list what the problem with a proliferation of short-term rentals is, then that would begin to build the body of evidence that we have for saying we're doing this because and here's all the reasons we're doing this. Is that is that reasonable, Carl? Yeah, absolutely, Chair. Okay. Well, 
I believe back in December, I sent in a list of uh, what are, are the problems we're trying to solve. And uh, Carl, I think you, you have that document. If you don't, let me know oh. and send it. No, I'm sure we, we've got it in our records, so I'm sure, Commissioner Brown. Okay, let's go ahead and add that too. Sorry, I just wanted to ask, since so many of our group is gone, do we have to have a quorum to continue? We do, and I I believe four out of four out of seven is still that's still majority. Um, let me check really quick. I was just reading the bylaws. It just says we have to have a majority of the members. Yeah, that's what I thought it said. Yeah. So okay. we're still we're still good. I just you, thought I'd Mr. better Brown. ask before oh. we continue on. Okay, good point. So nobody else leave, otherwise we'll have to adjourn. Okay, can we move? Are we ready to move on to number two then? <laughs> yeah. Yes. Uh, can I can I just clarify one thing then? Sure. On, on number one, uh, do we we do have? I think we do have consensus then that we like the idea of using primary residence versus this owner occupied, non owner occupied. Now that again, that might be a moot point. Um, once we get into, you know, if we're talking about this cap, uh, I need to work that massage that through in my brain that also, then if we go that direction, that are we talking about eliminating this idea then of renting out two rooms for a majority of the year and the whole house for 90 days of the year. Okay. That's let's, let's, let's do a, a perception check here of everybody, Bob. Um, I'm, uh, I'm not in favor of the, uh, two room limitation. Let me ask the question then in another way, uh, would it be reasonable for the city to have provisions in the ordinance that would allow people to rent rooms and we'll leave that number open for the moment, uh, in their house, um, basically all year or, you know, going with the uh, 270 days and then rent the whole house. Is that a reason? Do we want to ha have the ability for people to do that? Um, let me defer for the moment. I don't really have a good opinion on that. Maybe somebody okay, else. Greiner? So I, I think if there's a limit to the number of these, I I'm kind of uncomfortable with the two room limit. I, I think if, if, if it's a whole house and it's handled properly and it's done legally, I don't have a problem with that. But when you say the whole year, doesn't it quit being a short-term rental and become a long-term rental? I was talking there about being able to rent a certain number of rooms in, while you're living there for the entire year. Oh, okay. The person has the ability to do that. Uh, now we're getting in the mucky, confusing area here. What's your thought, John? Uh, my thought is yes, we should allow people uh, within their residence to, within the scope of the ordinance, to uh, rent rooms in their house while the primary owner uh, is uh, is living there. I am also in favor of that. Now, if somebody were to do that, would that be one of the one of the num one of the short term rentals that we would allow in the city then? as far as this cap number goes? My, my, my feeling on that is that would be uh, without limit, except for the 150 feet, uh, all the other provisions of the ordinance that we've had, the 150 feet uh, limitation, the parking limitations, those sorts of things. So it would not be included in the, in the 30 or 40 or whatever number we come up with. And I guess it, in terms of a rationale, 
I'm looking at the difference between renting my whole house out as a short-term rental. I'm looking at that as a business. If I decide to rent my spare bedroom upstairs, I'm looking at that as a home occupation. So that's, well, that's kind of how I draw the distinction. And, and I think that's a pretty good distinction um, and, and because it does start to get kind of gray. It starts to get a little fuzzy. You know, I, I've been... I've been wrapping my head around this whole idea of renting out two rooms. Jeremy and I've had a lot of discussion about this and, you know, it's, it's more like a bed and breakfast than it is a short-term rental. Um, not to say that it can't be a short-term rental because there's no one definition for short-term rentals necessarily out there. It doesn't say that it has to be a whole home rented. Um, but what there the 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 idea that that is a home occupation that that is by, by saying that you're you're essentially you are essentially saying that there is a distinction there is a difference between short-term rental and that renting of just two rooms right you're it is more of a home occupation it is more of a lodging level one for instance it meets the definition of lodging level one more than it meets the definition of or most definitions of short-term rental. Or whether it be two rooms or three rooms or, or whatever we decide, you know, and I, I, I'm, I'm, I guess I've, I've heard enough talk on this that I'm open to saying, you know, it could be two rooms, could be three rooms, could be four rooms. Uh, and, and I just wanted to note, Chair, if I could, for the um, for the public, we we did hold uh, public testimony at the beginning of the meeting. There is someone with their hand raised, and um, just wanted to let them know that we won't be taking any additional public testimony at this at this particular meeting, but certainly um, will be taking testimony at the next meeting. So thank you. Okay, thank thank you, Carl. I, I don't have the ability to see that. On That's okay. So let, let me poll the other the other members. Are, are, would you be okay with with that idea, or do you have other ideas on that? I don't want to I don't want to close this off to other ideas. I kind of feel like Carl was on to something where you know renting out of a room or two is is seems different to me than a real a serious uh, short term rental whole house kind of thing. Uh, if there's a way to nuance that differently, that might be a good idea, but I might take some time to think about Carl and Jeremy. To... John, if I can I make a, a, a radical recommendation here? I'm sorry. Sure. Um, there's a couple of things that we may be able to disposition on Carl's list. Uh, and we got a small group now and we're kind of missing some major parts of the, the uh, commission, but there's a couple of things that maybe we could kind of disposition really quickly, Carl, like the insurance requirement and yeah. the, um, taxes requirement. Um, is that something we could do, John, really quickly based on, you know, what we have four people here left to make a decision? Go for it. Uh, it seems like the insurance requirement um, is already covered in other places if you have a business license. Is that correct, Carl? Yeah, that's correct. Uh, Commissioner Soltis, and, and note that I added a couple, we added a couple of notes to this, um, to the table as well there. Uh, so the platform, so we said that, you know, platforms provide liability insurance or that they require it. Um, and that was kind of, you know, if you refer back to number two as well, the platforms, sort of take care of that tax and insurance idea. Not only do the platforms take care of it if they're using a platform, but even if they're not using a platform, the state requires it, state law, that they have to have a business license through the state. Therefore, they're gonna pay their taxes to the state. Those taxes then would ultimately come to the city. Um, so not necessarily a, you know, a need for us to, for the city, in other words, to get involved at that level in requiring that taxes and, and insurance re that, that they have that they that they show us that they have tax that they've paid their taxes and that they have the insurance, 
Um, now we could, through that affidavit in the renewal of the business license, we could ask them, have you paid your taxes? Yes. Um, do you have state required insurance? And we could cite the RCWs that require those things. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, great. They're signing their name to it. It's notarized. That goes in the record. You know, that's, uh, they, they're, they are adhering to law, to state law. Now, if they're out of compliance with state law, they've got other problems. Um, and the city doesn't necessarily need to get involved with it, maybe. So on both items, number two and three, staff has noted there that these could both be functions of that renewal affidavit. Um, and then, of course, in the regulations that we draft, we would, and I think we have some language in there now, um, that's maybe a little bit more specific, but we could get a little more generic with it and just say that they must meet those state mandated laws relative to taxes and insurance and, you know, certainly state it more eloquently than that. But. So, so can we cross two and three off the, uh, the chart there? Are we all in agreement with that or does anyone else have any other ideas? I agree. And I think the, the key to both to crossing those off is the function of the renewal affidavit. So okay. there you go. All right. Yes. And I'm in agreement with that as well. So it sounds like we have consensus on, on that. We can uh, deal with those issues. Uh, so number four gets a, is a little more, that's a little more difficult. So this is that 150 foot requirement. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right out of the frying pan and into the fire here. Um, and, and maybe, maybe we need to skip that. Okay, I was just going to say that. And keep going back because that's a way to control the number. And Yep. Uh, Sorry. I so. <laughs> no, I, I, I think that makes sense. Chair, are you okay with us moving forward past that? Well, ab now? Absolutely, yes. That, that makes perfect sense. Unless anybody else wants <laughs> to cover that one. Um, okay. So, uh, for, for code enforcement, um, we kind of talked about this a little bit earlier on. Um, so again, back to the license renewal. Uh, code enforcement, you know, the problem with code enforcement and, and short-term rentals is that by definition, they're short-term. Our code enforcement cannot move that quickly, you know, in order to, you know, if there's a problem, there's a party at the house or something like that, sure. Somebody could make a complaint through code enforcement and code enforcement would open a case but by the time we're able to actually substantiate any kind of um, any kind of uh, nuisance or any kind of code violation that's happened at that at the residence, we would already be you know they maybe have three or four more uh, rentals have have come through already. So not saying that code enforcement wouldn't be involved and that there wouldn't be uh, some case opened when we receive complaints. Um, it's just that the, the time that that would be best handled again is probably at that license renewal. We would have some uh, cases opened in some, in some cases, maybe we've had an opportunity to do more research. Maybe there's a, a police file that we're able to access and substantiate that nuisance um, or that code violation. Uh, maybe, maybe our code enforcement officer has had time to get through a full process um, and maybe not. And so by the time we get to that license renewal, we may have three or, you know, if we have three or four substantiated violations, well, I think we have pretty good reason to withhold that business license. If we have two or three complaints, but we haven't been able to substantiate those, then maybe we don't have good reason. But um, unless it is some egregious violation, um, our code enforcement mechanism likely would not be uh, effective in real time. Commissioner Soltis. But would it be effective, Carl, in um, finding people that are operating STRs illegally? Well, that's a, that's a good question. Um, right now, our code enforcement is not, you know, we don't, we're reactive. So we react to complaints. Um, we are not proactive in code enforcement unless, of course, we see uh, a, a life state, a violation, a building violation, for instance, somebody building a deck 
uh, without permits and we know they don't have permits, we would of course stop and talk to them and say, hey, you need to come in and get permits. Um, you know, or sometimes roofing works that way. You know, our, our building inspectors are out there a lot. They see some of these things happening. They know that they don't have permits. And so they get on top of that from a land use, from the land use side of things in code enforcement. Uh, we're really only proactive in sign code. We do sign sweeps periodically to kind of try and keep on top of signs, but otherwise we're not out looking for violations. Well, you could go Other to the Airbnb on, site oh, and see 30 um, places in Gig Harbor and you've got 15 registered properly. I'm not a brain sign, uh, surgeon, but that may be a, a signal. Yeah, no, that's true. It's just that we don't do that for anything else. And so we'd have to be careful about that. Now, if council wanted to make that a directive, that we do that. I mean, that's where sign sweeps come from. Council wants us to be proactive on signs. Well, either council or we get complaints. Or we get complaints. Good point, okay. Michelle. Yeah. And in some cases we get complaints. There's somebody could, I suppose, make a general complaint. Hey, there's too many short-term rentals in the city of Gig Harbor. Okay. That's a complaint. We would probably then have to look into it and maybe that's the way we would do it. Um, but looking at Airbnb or something like that also doesn't give you necessarily site specific data you know oftentimes you're seeing a lot of dots within the city limits but a lot of those dots are not actually in the city some of them are just outside the city they don't give you specific locations uh well yeah Car i agree with you it's a complaint driven system and so obviously if there's a lot of parties going on someplace and the neighbors uh, are aware this these people don't have a business license they can comp they can complain but we also had uh, some information about some services that are offered that uh, the city could hire that would look out after this. And you know, maybe the one that you had in the material was is not the best one, but a city obviously would go through some sort of competitive process to select one. Yes. Yeah, and I and I think that that's an option that's out there. And we've <clears throat> we've sat through um, a few webinars. Michelle sat through a couple of them. I've sat through three or four with different companies. Um, you know, they're not cheap, um, but they certainly do exist and they do handle, you know, they'll handle the whole gamut, you know, from permitting to enforcement, you know, tax collection, all that stuff. Could we justify it right now based on the number of short-term rentals we have in the city? I think it would probably be tough to do, um, but maybe, um, Certainly, if we don't do anything and we and and the numbers do proliferate down the road, um, as we think they might, then, you know, maybe we would. So, you know, I think that might be something the city keeps in its back pocket in case we get to a point where we couldn't um, administer our code or enforce our code effectively. Well, let, let me just say that I feel very strongly that we need part of our recommendation to the council should include a uh, encouragement to change the uh, the way that we uh, monitor compliance for short-term rentals, and and the evidence is clear. Uh, we've, we have experienced the proliferation of short-term rentals. It's been unregulated, and and people in the community have said this isn't right. We don't want this to happen. Take some action. So, I mean, things have to change in terms of monitoring uh, how many short-term rentals we have and, and whether we've got, whether our cap is, uh, is effective. Well, one of the things that uh, I saw in one of the ordinances is that there was a requirement that when the property is listed on a site that it had to have the permit number. So the city issues a permit, a license or whatever we're gonna call it and that number is there, it would be, I, I think it wouldn't be that difficult for somebody to Google uh, short-term rentals in the city of Gig Harbor a few times a year and just look to see that everybody uh, is listing a permit, a valid permit number. And if they're not, right. yeah. get on the phone and say, hey, what's going on here? I think you're right. I, and I think we may have included that in the last version, the last draft of the regulations. Um, if, if we didn't, I know we talked about it. 
um, and maybe it didn't make it in, but I, I think that's a, a really good recommendation. I think I'll. I don't think it was in there. I know we it, talked it, about it though. It wasn't added. No. And that was something else that I I agree. I really liked that. I thought that was a good thing that was in Walla Walla's. Any other uh, comments on this on this issue? So we're going to go ahead and look at including the permit number in uh, any marketing on this. And then uh, uh, we recognize that this is uh, uh, going to be handled to a large degree at the time of licensing, but there's also a complaint-based system to bring these to the attention of the city. Any, any other thoughts on that? Well, just to restate what I said, I think we, could, we should recommend to the council that the city uh, take uh, action on this on a regular basis. As, as you recently described here, and that the city uh, change its compliance practices in, in this instance. I, I, yeah, I can no. see that. Yeah, Carl's just added that. So that's going to be part of, of the uh, information here. Good. That's good, Carl. Okay, ready to move on to the next one? Yes. Taxes. Yes. So I think I think we've agreed that taxes are going to be pretty much handled through the third party platforms and through the state. Any yes. other thoughts on that? And the affidavit, that's right. Can we move on to guest log? Oh, John, Victoria, Carl, once you sure. do that with taxes, does that mean then the city will have visibility? Um, into the taxes that are being generated by the SDRs? Not necessarily, no. And <clears throat> we've done quite a bit of digging on how we can get a hold of that data. And it's not, not so easy. Um, you know, what we, what we get is really sort of lump sum, <clears throat> excuse me, lump sum data uh, relative to our, um, our lodging tax that comes back to us. It's, it's just not ag. It's just, we can't get down to that, that aggregate level of sort of breaking it out amongst all the different transient uses that are paying that tax. Um, so, you know, we've talked with our finance director, he's talked with DOR. Um, we've talked with, uh, I think we've talked with the County. Um, and one place where we may be able to get it, and, and it's kind of a long shot, we've done a little bit of research into um, these third party groups like Air DNA, for instance, there's a possibility that we could get some of that data from them if we were to pay them for the data. Um, there's also some portals through uh, like Airbnb actually has a, has a portal that a city can get access to and get data from. We don't exactly know what that entails yet. And Jeremy's been doing a little research on it, uh, uh, but I, I don't think he's gotten anything. He hasn't gotten anything conclusive yet. I've contacted him twice and haven't gotten anything back yet. Um, and on the website for it, it doesn't really indicate in depth uh, what level of information they provide. So uh, right now it's unknown what, what we could get from them in that manner. And in that case, you know, we're relying on one of these major platforms, right? So, you know, it's not, it's, it's not a, it's not a foolproof system, you know, if we, if we felt we needed to get that information and, you know, I guess that's another question. Do we need that information? Um, and what, and why do we need it? What, what would, what would it do for us? Does some of that revenue come back to the city? Absolutely. It comes back to the city. Yeah. Well, I can't imagine you guys just get this lump sum of money and says, here's the taxes and for a, a large group of activities and I'll help you happy. It, it, this seems like there has to be some more granularity possible from, you know, it just doesn't seem to make sense to me to get it in a lump sum. It's, that, you know, you said that, but it sounds odd. <laughs> yeah. The spreadsheet that I provided you all in your packets for this meeting tonight, that that is our data that we have. I mean, that's what I was, that's what I was given. And that's how we apparently get it. Um, wow. And that includes, so it includes STRs, it includes hotels, motels, 
uh, any of the any of the any of the uses that are paying into that um, lodging tax. You know, it it does seem awfully odd, but that's not the problem we're trying to fix here tonight. All right, and my bad. I You're right. We move on. Okay. Okay. Anything else on that? If not, then let's move on to the go the guest log. So with the guest log. Um, we added a note here and I'll read it um, for Commissioner Brown's benefit. The code might require that the operator, meaning the short-term rental operator, uh, maintain records sufficient to prove the number of nights the short-term rental was rented. So what would, the question we're asking here is what, what do we, why do we want this information in the guest log and what do we do with it? And so our response to that question right now is that the code could require that the operator maintain records sufficient to prove the number of nights the short-term rental was rented. We've talked a little bit about that, that with this affidavit system, we're kind of putting the onus back on the operator to maintain their own records, prove it if we need them to, but otherwise sign this affidavit, put your, put your name on it, notarize and say, yeah, I am doing everything right. I, I don't see that the city has a legitimate need to know how many nights uh, the operator has read it as STR. I think that's up for discussion for sure. That's the whole point is however, if we have a requirement of how many nights we need to know that. So, I mean, I, I don't think we need the guest log and I like the idea of maintaining records that if it's brought into question, they have something to prove what happened. Yeah, so, I mean, I like the second section of it. Yeah, and I was just going to say, Commissioner Gray, I didn't read the second section of that passage, which says the annual license renewal affidavit and review process could then require that documentation as necessary, right? And put as necessary. I'm, I'm ad libbing that in there, but therefore, it's, you know, it, it behooves the, the, the operator to keep good records, which we're kind of requiring them to do anyway through this affidavit. Um, they certainly, we wouldn't, ex I wouldn't expect somebody to get a form and, and fill it out, check a bunch of boxes and put their name on it. And these are, you know, it's a legal document, legally binding document, um, and not have records or data to back up what they're saying. So it would be, if they didn't, and we called it into question in order for them to get that business license and protect their investment, it would behoove them to have that, have something at the ready. Yeah, I think we started out in this with requiring a lot more information, such as the names and I think maybe even the license numbers of uh, people that were renting. And I, I, I think there was a pretty good case made that, that the city really shouldn't be collecting that data. Uh, the owner might want to do it to make sure that the renter doesn't walk off with his TV. But uh, uh, I think uh, what, what you have here, Carl, is reasonable. Other thoughts? Do we do the same thing for other businesses like nail salons and hair salons and restaurants? I don't think so. No. no. I don't think unless we can really justify that there's a good reason for collecting that, to having that data for the city's purposes, that I'm, I'm not really sure this is a valid requirement. I'm just trying to think about what it is we really want to accomplish with this information. And, and it makes sense if we're counting the number of nights based on you know, the uh, personal residence, if, that, if that's still in effect, you know, is, is it 89, is it 90, or is it, have you gotten over that? But if it's just a, a whole house rental, um, is it, Sometimes, Carl, do some people get licenses and then not use them? And so there will be a way of demonstrating that it's, a, it's an active STR. Yeah, I think that happens, I'm sure. Um, yeah, people, people register businesses all the time that they don't actually end up doing anything with. Um, so yeah, I think that's, a, that's certainly a possibility. Especially if you limit, if you're gonna limit STRs then if you're not using your STR for that purpose, then maybe you lose your license if you can't prove that it's, you know, being active. 
use it or lose it. It is one of the questions on renewing a business license. Is it, are you doing, are you conducting business that way currently? Oh, okay. that's, that's one of the questions on the license renewal form. Just saying. Okay. And, and maybe, maybe the issue here is that I, that we've said the code might, you know, or the code that we're requiring this information. And I think where I was trying to go with this is to say, yeah, we're not, we're not requiring that you keep a guest log. And in fact, we're not even saying anything about a guest log anymore, kind of taking it away from that idea of a guest log and saying, what you really need to do is keep good data so that you can show what you're doing with your business in case we need it, in case the city asks for it. Now we can't require, maybe we don't need to require them to do it. It just behooves them to. And maybe to Commissioner Brown's point, it doesn't need to be said. It's on, it's on them to do it if they don't. And then we ask for that information, they don't have it. Do we really need Seems to say anything? Seems like more of a suggestion. Play. Yeah. It's yeah, it's kind of more of a suggestion in some ways. And so does it belong in a code? Maybe not. Okay. Yeah, so, because if you're operating a business, keeping track of how many days you rented is is your it's your income. I mean, if somebody's doing good bookkeeping, that information is there in some format, I guess, is what I'm trying to say. So we maybe have some agreement that will eliminate this requirement? In favor of that. One, one thing I would point out is, I, I don't know if I mentioned it or not, but I, I ran, for about 10 years, I had a short-term rental that was not owner occupied in a resort community. And uh, there is an IRS requirement that uh, you have to be able to, if you use the property, if I were to use the property, I had to be able to demonstrate that it was not more than a certain number of uh, days per year or as a percentage of the number of days that I rented the property. Right. So this data, a, a, a owner would have to keep this data anyway in order to satisfy the IRS requirements. Unless they've changed the code. So we don't need it, in other words, in our, in our, in our local code, our local ordinance. I think they're gonna be keeping this information regardless. If they're not, they could have a big problem with uh, somebody higher up than us. So that kind of goes back to the whole, the same argument or the same rationale behind taxes and um, and insurance as well, that we don't really need to be monitoring that at the local level. Just can't think okay of a reason why we need it, Carl, at a local level. What? Yeah. Can, can we kill this one and move on? Do it. Yes. Yep. yep. So I think eight we're also skipping then, right? Yeah, this one yes. I've already gone over in great detail. Uh, okay. Here's another hot issue. Yeah, so the events definition. So we've talked about um, not allowing events uh, within short-term rentals. Um, and we, we heard some from some folks that our, the definition or our idea about this was not sufficient. Um, and that we would need to be careful about how we define it. So Jeremy found this definition. I think this was the city of Bellingham. Correct. City of Bellingham, and I'll read it for Commissioner Brown's benefit. Short-term rentals must not include weddings, banquets, parties, charitable fundraising, or other gatherings for direct or indirect compensation. Small, informal, non-commercial gatherings of family and friends of short-term rental guests are permitted provided the gathering is not a disturbance to the surrounding neighborhood. Of course, there's a little bit of, it's a little, it's a little vague uh, there towards the end, but I don't know that there's not going to be some vagueness in, uh, in a definition like this anyway, unless we wanted to say a small gathering is not more than six people or something. But there again, we get into this whole idea of how, how in the world would we enforce that and unless the police were to show up at the party and that would be the only way we would be able to substantiate that 
And to add that to that, Carl, um, as of 2020, uh, at least Airbnb has a ban on parties or events. Um, give me some different language on that. That's right. Um, so it's also the platforms themselves are kind of taking this uh, issue on. Yeah, they're starting to police themselves because they're getting they're getting banned all over the country and they're getting sued, quite frankly. Mm -hmm. So thoughts? I'm okay with that. I am as well. I think it's it's good. You can never get something that's completely gonna cover all exceptions. You just have to let some common sense reign, and this seems like a pretty good attempt at it. I'm good with it. Okay, uh, maximum number of tenants an STR may house. Um, so <clears throat> the question was how, how would we determine the maximum occupancy? You know, we've, what methodologies the building department use? There, there's no real hard and fast um, answer on this one. Um, I added a couple of things here that weren't in your version um, that, you know, talking with the building um, official, one of the things that they look for in occupancy, especially with a single family home, is whether or not occupants can safely egress, you know, whether or not they can get out of the house safely. So that's one thing. Um, and and really, maybe it's the only thing that needs to be said. I mean, if, if this is a single family home, it has occupancy as a single family home already. I don't know that anything that we do in our regulations uh, limiting that is going to, is going to, we're, we're, we can't be more restrictive, um, I don't think, or it was, we can't be less restrictive, I should say, than what the building code would allow. We, we certainly could be more restrictive, but I don't know what the point of being more restrictive would be. Um, we've got a single family home, it's designed and it's designed to house a certain number of people. Likelihood is that it's going to continue to do that even, even if it's rented out. What I've suggested here is that a maximum number of guests shall not exceed the number allowed by the pertinent building codes. And we could, we could get those codes from our building department. We could ref, we could cite them in this ordinance. And it would Carl, seem to me that, like that would probably handle the issue. Is that driven by bedroom numbers? Like a two bedroom is a lot, you have six people can live in the house, three bedroom, eight, so on and so forth. Yeah, well, and it well, and then it depends on the size of the bedroom too, right? So it's yeah, all it's, about it's all about whether or not if there's a fire, essentially, can those people get out of the home safely? I believe it's there's a, a square footage figure. Um, it's obviously not my expertise, but uh, I dealt with it previously. Uh, I think it's from the International Property Maintenance Code. That's where that number can be found, and it's. Uh, kind of occupancy for different different types of rooms and uses within the house. So the building code has an established set of uh, number of occupants based on several factors. So yeah. if you refer to the building codes, then you kind of covered it. That's that's what I think. And if we were getting reports that a short term rental was over utilizing their home, you know, that's something that um, definitely the um, the fire marshal would be interested in looking into. I think the other thing too that is going to put a limitation on the number of guests is the parking requirements. Yeah. Because you can only have uh, so many cars. Right. So are, are we good with that with a with the building code reference? I am. Commissioner Brown? I think he's not there. Okay. Stepped away for Take a, a break. Commissioner Saltis? Yep. Building code reference is good. Okay. Fine. Real, real quick, um, we do need to make sure that Commissioner Brown is there for a quorum. Ah. And so if he's not That's with what I wondered. Yeah. Continue. Call, Daniel. Thank you, Daniel. Let's take a short <laughs> break then. 
it's almost a, it's almost a German time, but uh, probably before we have any more discussion, we'll we'll wait for him. His screen is still on, so he's technically still engaged in the. Oh well, we'll sit here on number ten and wait. Wait a minute. I don't. Yeah. I, my my sense is that we're not going to get through all this tonight. Um, anyway, so I'm glad that we didn't notice the the public hearing on the 21st. <laughs> <laughs> well, we made a pretty good dent in it anyway. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. No, I think we we covered a lot of ground tonight and a lot of really hard ground, and there's still some left that that needs to be. Um, there he through. is. And if we go after ten, back. we can make a motion. <clears throat> yeah. If we if we go after eight. Isn't yep. it? Okay. Yes. Yeah, Commissioner uh, Commissioner Brown, we were looking at number ten there, and uh, making a decision there on whether the building codes would be sufficient for restricting the number of persons that could occupy a home. Are you in a agreement with that, or do you have some other ideas? No, I am in agreement. Okay. We can move on to fines. Fine. So our current draft states that enforcement shall be conducted consistent with all applicable Gig Harbor Municipal Code enforcement provisions. In addition, violations of this chapter sub shall be subject to a $500 fine for the first offense and $1,000 for each repeat offense. Now, um, with our new, with this new idea of utilizing the business license, you know, when we were thinking about this, we were thinking more about this being a renewable land use permit. And so we would be going through kind of a more traditional code enforcement process. Um, we could leave this in um, as it stands and it would, I, I just, I don't know that it would get used a lot um, given how short-term rentals operate just by their nature. And if we're using the business license um, revocation um, and or withholding renewal of that business license is kind of our hammer. I don't know that we need these additional fines um, included within our code. We, we do have already code enforcement provisions, fees and fines um, for that otherwise throughout our code that would, that would apply to short-term rentals as well. My own thoughts on this is I think the the issue of fines is important, uh, and I think if uh, if you've got three violations, uh, we need to pull the permit uh, because I I think you're going to have to be pretty egregious to rack up three violations uh, in this. And another thing is if you are operating an illegal short-term rental, in other words, you have not gotten a permit, I think we really ought to have a very big fine for that one. I'm, I'm with you on that. So. I agree with that too. And I think, I think it's important to have fines because it means that it's something that the city takes seriously. Uh, somehow, it, 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 I think it's important to say that. Commissioner Soltis. Well, my question, Carl, is it says consistent with all gig harbor enforcement provisions. Now, what, what kind of fines are embedded in that language? Well, it, it varies there. You know, right now our, our enforcement is kind of cast across three different um, sections of the gig harbor municipal code. It's a little convoluted. Um, and in fact, the city council is has requested a presentation from our division the planning division uh, on well not the planning division i should say from from our department from the from the community development department regarding code enforcement specifically and that's coming up at a at a at a study session to tell them <clears throat> sort of what the um, history of code enforcement is in the city our process history uh, how we're currently handling it, 
um, and then sort of any maybe pitfalls that, that we see in administering that those provisions. Right now, our main, so for a, for a land use violation, so Title 17, if you are in violation and we've issued a notice of violation and you're not coming into compliance, then it's $100 a day retroactive to the time that the notice of violation was issued. Oftentimes what happens is we issue a notice of violation and folks appeal that notice of violation. And then we kind of get into this um, washing machine cycle of um, back and forth, trying to get to compliance, go to the hearing examiner on the appeal. Uh, hearing examiner may issue uh, something requiring some kind of compliance by a date certain. And very rarely do we actually get to a point of um, uh, receiving those, those fines. I just don't know how this, how this stacks up against other violations. Is this, I mean, an STR violation might be, I don't know, a noise, a noise problem. Um, mm -hmm. Would that be more of a penalty than a, a no, normal citizen would get if they had, if they got a noise violation citation? <clears throat> Well, noise violations are handled by the um, police department in our, in our current code. Is there a fine associated with that? Uh, well, they yeah they they do have. Um, I, I don't I don't know how that what that looks like though. Hmm. Citations, um, and misdemeanors. I guess my question is, you know, is is the is a violation of an STR. Um, more more severely punished than a, another similar violation that's not an STR. Yeah, this this would be our most severe. If we went with these numbers, is five hundred dollars and a thousand dollars. That would be more than than we apply to any other violation that I'm aware of in our code. Unless you get into like you know filling a wetland and, and ecology gets involved or something like that, right? <laughs> It's something different, but a comparable, yeah, I would say this is probably more than. <clears throat> you guys all comfortable with having the biggest fine in the city being for an STR violation? You know, that doesn't bother me because what we're talking about is the responsibilities of a business owner here. And one of their responsibilities is to you know, have rules that enforce rules that uh, eliminate uh, uh, nuisances. So, uh, yeah, I, I don't, I'm not bothered by the fact that these may be the highest fines. Commissioner Grana? I, I, I'm not bothered by it either. I agree with Commissioner Brown. Commissioner Schultz, you okay with that? Um, I'm still, uh, I'm not going to buy into that big a fine for the STR. So I, I guess I'd be in the minority here. But, well, but I, I'd also, I'd also just say that, you know, $100 a day, given how long some of these code enforcement cases take, sometimes adds up to a fairly large number. So in that way, this number, these numbers could be fairly small, right? You, you could look at it that way. These aren't cumulative. These are kind of one-time penalties that were that we're providing here, unless they are repeat offenders. But if we go with Commissioner Krosik's idea of kind of a three strikes and you're out idea, then yeah, they're one-time fees, but then ultimately, you know, the ultimate penalty is that you're losing your ability um, to Top recoup three. your costs on that. We do need a motion here in a couple of minutes if we're going to extend That's past eight. Right, I've got uh, seven minutes till uh, eight. So we can go on for a few. What's what's the uh, just the consensus of the group? Do you want to go past eight? No. 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 Okay. <laughs> we'll, we'll we'll cut it that off was right unanimous. <laughs> yeah, that was easy. Uh, yeah, I would be really surprised, Carl, if you issued even one fine during the year. I think the threat of having these fines out there is probably going to be sufficient, but you're not going to have to use it. 
And I also like the idea of $100 a day for people who don't get a permit. Yeah, I like that too, actually. I'll have to look into that. It's in a different title. Um, if well, no, that's not true. For a permit, um, that would be something that would be that would fall under our regular code enforcement for Title 17. I was thinking of the life or business license. Um, I don't know what the penalty is there, and actually, DOR probably um, enforces that. But um, I, and I think it's it's key that it's for the permit license, not for for the not for a business license that it's for the permit okay yeah mr salt is you okay with that i'm i'm good with having a large fine for not having a str permit i'm not okay. i'm not so good with the routine violation being um 500 and a thousand okay commissioner mm -hmm. brown yeah i'm okay with it Bob, what would what would you be comfortable with in terms of the dollar amounts? You know, um, I don't know, five hundred, seven fifty, a thousand, maybe scale it up a little bit like that. Thousand dollars is a lot of money, and it's I can't imagine what the violation would be. Um, what are we talking like a, a parking violation or uh, what kind of violation are we gonna? find them for that's a good question too other than well, not I'm having a permit the most likely violation you're going to get is is a noise violation somebody somebody's got a party and it really gets out of control parking it's unlikely anybody would really notice unless takes up the whole street. Or they're having an event that's not allowed. Mm -hmm. Yes. Trash, cleanliness, I could see those maybe becoming you know, issues for, for some of these if they're not <clears throat> managing the property properly. Well, maybe there's a, a sliding scale. Well, I, I would, we're getting kind of late here. I, I don't want to parse this anymore. So I'll, I'll just say I've said what I said and I'll leave it there. Maybe we need further discussion on number 11. The larger group. Okay. Uh, this might be a, uh, well, let's just deal with number 12 because I think we can deal with that rather quickly. It sounds the direction that we're going to, that we're going is the city probably will not have to compensate for any losses here. Is that reasonable, Carl? And I, I left this one blank in the discussion column because I wasn't sure we I, I and I'm not I can't remember where we pulled this question from if it was um, if this was from from the meeting or if it was from Commissioner Soltis you had sent us some stuff Mr. Krosik you had sent us um, some follow-up as well and I couldn't remember where it came from so I couldn't really figure out what the context was here I threw it okay. in any way in case that person might be able to um, fill us in and and i don't even understand what it means can you explain what that means well i'll take a stab at it it might have been mine um if if we take away the ability of somebody to utilize an str that they've invested in and done you know upgrades to then that's kind of a taking if you i think that's we've taken something away from that person and I mean, I, you hear a lot about that in a lot of context. And so maybe that city might be liable for taking away uh, something from that STR owner. That was my understanding of what this one meant too. And I think it was a comment that was made by, in one of the meetings by a citizen, how are you gonna compensate us for the loss of our business? I think that's where it may have came from. Well, Matt. That does that does get into sort of the larger question of, of some of these regulations, you know, in kind of in general and and getting back to the idea that we do need to have some good um, data or some government governmental reason why we want to institute a few of these regulations. And that gets back to what the chair had asked us to do some research on. Um, and bring back. So maybe this is one that we need to table as well. 
along with the rest of them. It's, I don't think it's something that we're going to be able to answer quickly. Okay, well, we're just about to at the eight o'clock hour. So this might be a good place to adjourn. Uh, chair, uh, re, uh, chair entertains a motion for adjournment. So moved. Is there a second? A okay. second. Okay, it's been moved and seconded to adjourn. All in favor say aye. Aye. Uh, aye. Okay, we are adjourned for the evening. Thank you very much, everybody. Well done, uh, Chair. Uh, very productive timing.